Hello. In this video, I want to talk a little about the concept of magnetic susceptibility and explain how this and other response functions behave when systems cross a phase boundary. We are going to take a rather simplistic approach to this topic and focus on finite systems only. The textbooks go into much more detail on this area as explaining the statistical mechanics of phase transitions is one of the seminal achievements in the physics of the 20th century. The mathematics that needs to be introduced in order to develop a full understanding of this topic is really quite difficult, however. We are thus going to take a shallow dive into this topic here. You will hopefully look at this topic in much more depth in Chavdar's lectures, and this shallow dive will provide you with the insight you need to keep your bearings when the maths gets more difficult. So without further ado, let's get into the content of the video. In the last few exercises, we have been studying the two-dimensional Ising model that has the Hamiltonian that I have shown here. To make the maths in this video nice and simple, we are going to neglect the second interaction term in this expression and return to studying a system of non-interacting spins with this Hamiltonian. Note that the sum of spins in this expression is just the magnetization of the state. Our Hamiltonian for the system is thus very simple. It is just minus the magnetic field H multiplied by the magnetization of the state M. Let's now suppose that we want to calculate the canonical partition function for this system. As you have learned in previous exercises, the partition function is given by this expression here. The sum in this expression runs over all the microstates. For each state, we must compute E to the power of beta multiplied by the energy. Beta, remember, is 1 over the temperature. Furthermore, as I have just explained, the energy of each state is minus H times the magnetization of the state. So this is the um, field, the minus h that appears in that expression, and this is the magnetization of state j. Now, having just written this expression for the partition function, we're now going to do something completely different, and we're going to differentiate the logarithm of the partition function with respect to beta h. So we're going to take this expression and differentiate it with respect to beta h. By using the chain rule, we can see that this derivative is equal to the expression shown here. Okay? All I've done there is differentiate the logarithm of z. And then replace z with um, the expression for z that I've just written. We can then use the fact that the derivative operator it distributes over addition to rewrite this expression as the following. When we do this derivative, we ex um, we, with this bit of differentiation, we ex re obtain the following. So this is, now notice that this is just the ensemble average for the magnetization. So what we've shown here is that if we have the partition function, we can get, as a function, we can get the ensemble average of the magnetization by differentiating it. If we have an analytic function for the partition function, we do not need to do this explicit sum over all the microstates. The problem is, however, that in the vast majority of cases, we cannot construct these um, explicit, explicit analytic expressions for the partition function, so we are forced to do something like the sum over the microstates. Now, the fact that you can calculate the average magnetization by taking a derivative of the logarithm partition function shouldn't really come as a surprise, as we have already seen how you can do something similar to get the ensemble average of the energy. I'm discussing the fact that you can do this differentiation here as it will be important when it comes to deriving and understanding the susceptibility that is the main subject 
of this video. So without further ado, let's get on to what this susceptibility actually is. So the susceptibility is equal to the derivative of the magnetization with respect to the magnetic field strength, as I've shown in the equation that has just appeared. Okay, so the chi is the susceptibility. We're now going to derive an expression for this susceptibility. This should be possible as the susceptibility, like the heat capacity, is a response function, and we have seen in previous exercises that we can compute the heat capacity by taking an ensemble average. How do we do this in order to get the susceptibility? So to, to derive the expression for the susceptibility, we proceed as follows. We first note that if we take the partition function and multiply it by its inverse, we get 1. We can now replace the z by the expression for the partition function as a sum over all microstates, as shown here. z to the minus 1, meanwhile, we're going to replace with e to the power of the negative logarithm of z. We will then bring the e to the negative power of the logarithm of z inside the sum and replace the product of exponentials with the exponential of a sum, as shown here. We're now going to differentiate this expression that we've just arrived at with respect to beta h. This is rather straightforward differentiation problem gives us the result shown here, which can be rearranged to give the result for the average magnetization as a derivative of the logarithm of a partition function that we derived on the previous slide. I'm not going to go through the process of rearranging this equation and will instead leave it to you as an exercise. Instead, I'm going to differentiate this expression with respect to beta h for a second time, which will bring me to the result shown here. To make sense of this result, we first need to note that the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function here is equal to the average magnetization. This is just the result that we've arrived at previously. Let's now take this second derivative here and bring it outside of this sum. It doesn't depend on the index of the sum, so we can do that. Notice that what is left inside the second term here is what was inside this term, term at the top. This second sum is just 1, as we can see from the top of the slide. What is left inside this sum, when this sum is evaluated, this whole thing is thus just 1. Let's now tidy up and rearrange what we have in this expression. We've arrived at the following. What is left looks a lot like an ensemble average. It has that form of an ensemble average. We are taking the canonical ensemble average of this quantity in this shape here. We can thus rewrite this whole expression as follows by using the angle bracket nomenclature that we have used throughout this module to denote ensemble averages. So we have the second derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to beta h is give equal to this ensemble average. This result brings us tantalizingly close to an expression for the susceptibility chi in terms of an ensemble average. Remember, the susceptibility is the derivative of the magnetization with respect to the field. The ensemble average at the bottom of the slide is thus equal to the derivative of the magnetization with respect to beta h, as shown here. We want the susceptibility, however, which is the derivative of the magnetization with respect to h and not beta h. This problem is easily overcome by using the chain rule, however. The chain rule allows us to write the derivative of the magnetization with respect to h as the following product of derivatives. The second derivative in this expression is easy. It is just equal to beta. We thus arrive at the final result. 
uh, the susceptibility can be computed by taking the following ensemble average. In your assignment on the Ising model, you will use this expression to calculate the susceptibility. Before you get onto that, however, let's just take a moment to think about how we can interpret this quantity. In doing so, we are going to consider the behaviour of this quantity for a system of non-interacting spins. In previous videos, and in doing the first assignment, you learned that the partition function for a set of n non-interacting spins is given by the expression that's shown at the top of the slide. We've also just learned that the magnetization of this expression is given by this derivative. If you differentiate the logarithm of that z, the 2 to the n cosh to the n beta mu h, with respect to beta h, what you arrive at is the following expression for the average magnetization as a function of field strength. When we plot the average magnetization that we arrived at here, with respect to h, we get the result shown here. Now, we can work out what the susceptibility that we will look like as a function of the field strength without doing any further analytic derivations. All we need to do is look at this graph. The reason this works is that the susceptibility is the derivative of the average magnetization with respect to h. In other words, it's the gradient of the blue line um, in the graph. So, in this region, in front of the line, the susceptibility will be small, as the gradient of the blue curve is small. If we go to the right of that line, the susceptibility will increase as the gradient in this part of the curve is larger. If we have this third line, beyond that line, the gradient goes back to being small again. There must, therefore, be a peak in the susceptibility as we go from negative magnetic field to positive magnetic field. What we are looking here is the behaviour of a thermodynamic variable and a response functions as the system undergoes a finite size phase transition. The transition the system is going through here involves the magnetization passing from a negative value to a positive value. You can see that this transition takes place pretty quickly as the field changes sign from negative to positive. The fact that the transition is rapid ensures that the transition is accompanied by a peak in the, uh, in the response function, which is just the derivative of the thermodynamic variable. In this case, the response function is the susceptibility. This behaviour is what characterises first-order finite-size phase transitions. When you have a finite-size first-order phase transition, the values of the thermodynamic variables change rapidly over some region of phase space and in response to environmental so some re region of phase space in response to environmental changes like magnetic field or temperature these rapid changes in the thermodynamic variables are accompanied by a peak in the response function such as the magnetization such as the susceptibility or heat capacity the reason why the peak in the response function accompanies the transition is obvious as long as you remember that the response function is just the derivative of the thermodynamic variable with respect to an intensive variable. If the thermodynamic variable is changing rapidly with respect to some quantity, as it must be when you cross one of these transitions, the derivative with respect to that quantity must be large within that region of rapid change and there must be a peak. Let's finish, in, finish by noting what happens to the curves in these figures if we increase the temperature. When the temperature is increased, 
the blue curve um, is replaced by the red curve shown here. You can see that the, this red curve transitions from negative to positive magnetization less rapidly than the blue curve. When we plot the susceptibility, we thus find that the peak in it is smaller and broader than the peak at the lower temperature. I'll finish there for today. I hope you found this video useful and the discussion of these graphs of the behaviour of the thermodynamic variables and response functions around a finite size phase transition useful. I would heartily recommend trying to think about the graphs of these quantities. Don't just get caught up in analytic maths. If you can talk about these things graphically, you will find the analytic derivations so much easier to understand. Always draw a diagram. Thanks for your attention and good luck with the exercises.